Well, hello, Internet, and welcome to part eight of my C++ tutorial series. In this part of the tutorial, I'm going to cover the bubble sort. We're going to take a look at recursion, factorials, Fibonacci numbers, how to overload functions, and we're going to solve a whole bunch of different problems. Like always, all the code and a transcript of this video is available in the description underneath this video, and I have a lot to do, so let's get into it. All right, so if you haven't watched any of the previous tutorials, you definitely should start at part one, otherwise you may be confused. Okay, in the last part of the video, I went and created this generate random vector function that you see right here, and we're gonna use it here with our bubble sorts. And rather than just do a basic bubble sort, I mean, I'm obviously gonna show you how a bubble sort works, but I'm also going to output information in regards to how our vector is changing as we sort it. All right, so that's just an added little benefit that we have here. So our bubble sort is not going to return anything and it's gonna be called bubble sort. And it's just a way of sorting values in a vector in this situation. So we are going to receive our vector here and we're going to get a reference to our vector so that we'll be able to change it directly. And then we're gonna come down here and we're gonna start creating it. So let's just paste that in there, whoops. And there we go, all right. Okay, so in creating this guy, basically the way the bubble sort is going to work is that you're going to have an outer loop that is going to decrease in size each time. And what I mean by loop is we're gonna have a while loop on the outside. So we're gonna have two different loops. And the goal is to have the largest number at the end of the list whenever the outer loop completes one cycle. So let's just start here. The very first thing that we're going to need to do for our bubble sort is we're going to initialize i and this is going to be equal to whatever the vector size is that we have reference to minus one. Okay, so there we go. We have the size and we know we're gonna be working with that. So then we have to create our while loop. So while i is greater than or equal to one, we are going to continue cycling. And of course we want this to be here and to get rid of that. All right, so just a little mistake. All right, so then we're gonna have another loop inside of this while loop. And it's gonna say while j is less than i, we are going to once again continue cycling inside of it. So I'm going to have this inner loop and what it's gonna do is it's going to start comparing indexes at the beginning of the loop. So it's going to sort of the, basically, I mean, the whole concept of bubble sort is that the largest number is gonna be at the end. The largest number is going to bubble up to the end. And then I'm just going to be comparing all of the different indexes as I go through. It sounds confusing, but that's the reason why I'm also going to go and print out every single thing that is happening the entire time the sort is working. So inside of here, I'm gonna say is, and I'm going to go and get the first index that I'm comparing and place that inside of there, greater than, and then I'm going to get the second index that I'm comparing to, and I'll go vector, and then we're gonna use j, and then we're also going to use the vec, and we're gonna use j plus one, all right? And that's gonna output on the screen. That has nothing to do with the bubble sort, except it's gonna print out over here so that you'll be able to see exactly what's going on with our bubble sort. So then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say if the vector j is greater than or equal to the vector j plus one, well, in that situation, I'm going to output on the screen that a switch is going to be made between our, our uh, different elements inside of our vector. And to make that switch, I'm gonna create a temporary holding cell, which is gonna hold the first item that is inside of our vector. Then what I can do is I can go the vec and j, which I just stored its value and I can instead store in the value of j plus one. Okay, so I'm just moving the values in the different indexes around whenever there is the need for a change. So is equal to, and then get the value that I had stored in temp. So that's how we're gonna be able to switch the values inside of our vector. And whenever that happens, else, if that came back as not true, well then I'm gonna output on the screen that I don't 
want to switch the values inside of our array or inside of our vector. See, you're going to see here doing it this way just so it's very easy to see exactly how a bubble sort works. And then what I'm going to do is increment the value of J. And then after I have that all set up, I'm going to go for auto K and get all the whoops values in R vector and I'm going to output them on the screen so you're going to see every single change to our vector every single time we go through a loop so I'm going to go and print out all the values of k and this is something I might as this tutorial continues I might show you a neat way of printing out all of the values in a vector in a really neat way let's try that I think I'm going to add that on as a problem that just came up okay so let's get rid of some of this space here so that we can see everything on the screen at once. Then what I'm gonna do is at the very end here, I'm going to output end of round. And that just means that I went through and compared indexes for all of the different items that are inside of our vector. So I can just go and do that. And then after this, I can decrement the value for one and start all over again with our outside while loop. All right, so there is our whole entire bubble sort with a lot of extra stuff. So basically the bubble sort part is gonna be this and this, not the printf part. And then we're also going to, of course, check if it's greater than or equal to the two different things. And then if they are, we're going to move them around and then else we're not gonna do anything. And then at the end, we're gonna output all those on the screen. Okay, so to test this, and then so you can see how the bubble sort works, I'm gonna go up inside of main and call for it to work. So I'm just gonna create a vector. Oh, one other thing, kind of neat. Um, if you want to use the different versions of C++, what you do here, and you're gonna wanna do this, is you're gonna right click on this, come down here to properties, and I'm assuming you're on NetBeans. And then under C++ compiler, you're gonna wanna click on this guy right here, and you're gonna wanna put this line in right here. I'm gonna copy it just in case you can't see it. I'm gonna say okay. And that's gonna force us to use the 14 version, 2014 version of C++. So that is what you're gonna type there. Dash standard, no spaces, is equal to C++ 14. You could also put 17 inside of there. And the compilers are going to recognize some of the, a lot of the 2017 changes to C++. I know it's 2018, but they haven't really taken effect in every single compiler. So you're going to get different results depending upon what. So that's why I'm using 2014 for right now. All right. So what we're going to do here, and the reason why I imported generate random vector is I'm going to have it generate a random vector for me here. So I'm going to call this vector values, and then I'm going to call generate random vector. And I'm going to say that I want 10 values between 1 and 50. And that will generate that. And I don't believe I needed anything else for my generate random vector. Nah, everything looks like it's fine. So that was a useful little function that we created in a previous tutorial. And then I'm going to call bubble sort. And I'm going to pass the vector values. And this is a reference to vector values. And then after that, I am going to output on the screen the um, changed vector after everything has been sorted. So I'll go vector values, and then I can just go standard C out and X and a new line. All right, so there we go. And over here, you're gonna be able to see ex precisely how the bubble sort works. So we'll just run this and there you can see it. All right, so cool. And you can see here that everything has been properly sorted to 10, 14, see, it's good sort. All right, so what we do is we are going to compare two to 46, and hopefully you can see this. This is how the bubble sort works, see? So it's going two and 46. Well, is two greater than 46? No, it isn't, so don't switch anything. Then what we're gonna check next is we're gonna go to this line, 46 and 33, we're gonna compare those. We're gonna say, is 46 greater than 33? Yes, it is, okay, switch. See, and that's what they mean by bubbling up. So it's going to move the biggest number up here. And then you can see 46 and 14, and you can see that the 46 moves up, 46 moves up, 46, and it's just comparing index to index to index to index to index until we get to this point right here where the biggest number in the entire vector is this number right here, 46. And then once we have checked every single index, it's the end of the round. Then what we're gonna do is we're going to check the next one. See, two and 33 and 14, da, 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 da. 
and you're going to see that 43 is the biggest number and you're going to see as we go on that eventually 43 is going to get to the highest point right here and you're going to also see that we don't check this one we don't waste time computer processing time checking 43 and 46 because we already know that because the outer loop has already gone through and checked it and you can see over time that's going to check every single one of the indexes inside of here until we get to the very very end in which we see that every single vector value is in proper order. And as you can also see, it doesn't matter if uh, values are the same. All right, so there is the bubble sort and precisely how it works. And also it provides a demonstration, I think a useful demonstration for ways that you could go and analyze how other algorithms work, other sorting algorithms or other algorithms in general. You know, on your own time, if you wanna figure out how different things work, well then just, you can see that you can just output a little bit of information like that and you can learn a lot on your own. And now that we got the bubble sort out of the way, I'm gonna go over and I'm gonna talk a little bit about recursion and how we can calculate factorials. Okay, so recursion is just a real, here, if you wanna know what recursion spelled like, there's recursion. Okay, so recursion is just whenever, or a recursive function is one that calls itself. And the one rule whenever you're working with recursive functions is that you are going to have to have an exit condition, otherwise you're going to have an infinite loop. So what I wanna do in this example is we are going to have a function called get factorial and you're going to pass in a value like three for example and how it's going to figure out the factorial let's go make that a little case e or lower case e is it's going to take three and multiply it times two which is going to multiply times one and that's how we're going to get our factorial and how we're going to do that is we're going to use a recursive method to get it so i'm going to create a function that is going to be called factorial. It's going to return an int and it's going to return or receive a number that it is going to perform some calculations on. So let's go down here and let's go and create that. And this is going to be pretty simple. So what it's going to do is it's going to receive a number and here is going to be the condition in which I am going to end calling the function again. So I'm gonna say if the number that comes in here is equal to one, well, in that situation, I'm gonna return one. See, that's a situation in which we're no longer going to call our function. Then what we're gonna do is I'm gonna go int result is equal to number times, and then I'm gonna call the factorial function again. See, there's a function calling itself. So we'll go number and minus one and there it is so that might look a little bit confusing but it's not all right so let's move that down there well actually let's move this out of the way all right so that's better so let's go like this and like that okay so looks a little bit weird because it is calling itself and then we're going to go and get the result and we will return the result from the function so basically the way this function is operating is the very first time through, let's say we give a value of three is passed inside of it. What's gonna happen is we're gonna go and get three times and we're gonna go factorial is going to be equal to, we're gonna go factorial and then it's gonna be two is going to be the change. See, we took number minus one. Okay, so that's the first time through. Well, what happens with this factorial that comes down here? Well, that's the second time through. And in this situation, it's gonna be two times. And once again, it's gonna be factorial. And in this situation, it's gonna be one this time. Then we're gonna come down and the next way through here is we're going to have a value of one. Well, what happens when we have a value of one? Well, you can see right here that ends calling the factorial function over and over again. So it's gonna return a value of one. So what it's gonna do is it's gonna return one. And that means that this is gonna replace this. So this is going to become one. And then this is gonna replace this. And that means that this is going to become two. And then you get a final value equal to six. All right, so that's how recursion works. It always works that way. You have a, an exit parameter and then you just call the function over and over again. I'm gonna give you another example using uh, Fibonacci numbers here in a minute. But let's come in here and let's actually call this. So I'm gonna go standard and print this out. And I'll just use the exact example that I just had. Factorial is equal to three. And then we can call factorial is equal to three. And I'll put this on the screen so that we can see that it indeed works. And if we run it, you can see factorial comes back as six, just as I demonstrated in the example. And of course we can change this to whatever we want. Let's change it to six, change this to six. Da, 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 da. 
and you can see it comes out to 720. So factorials get big very, very quickly. And there you go. That is the first example of recursion. There's going to be another example of recursion. If you have any problems, just make sure you have included all the different, uh, uh, different libraries that I have imported here, and you should have no problems. And now that I have that set up, that brings us to our very first problem of the day. All right, so what I want you to do is I want you to figure out on your own how to do what I mentioned previously, which was to print an array horizontally on a screen. And what I want it to look like is that. I want it to look nice and neat and to be displayed on the screen. I'm gonna grab this so that there's no deforming of this. And there we go. Okay, so your job is to have an array. This top row is gonna be the indexes for our array. And then this is going to be nice and neatly going to be all of the different values stored inside of our array. And I've taught you everything you need to do this. And you can pause your screen right now to go and create that. Otherwise, I'm going to create it right now or you can get a little bit of a hint here. I want to show you what I'm going to put in the main function. Okay, so basically the main function is just going to be the creation of a vector. And there that is. I'll go the vec is equal to, and this is why you need the C++ version 14 version, is the creation. So I'm going to go 10 and throw some just random old values inside of here. And 9 and 11 and 6 and 14. Doesn't matter. There we go. Got all those in there. So that's created a vector with a whole bunch of values. And then you're going to create a function called print horizontal vector and pass in the vector and that's going to give you a lot of practice and a whole bunch of different things so now you can pause your video and try to make it on your own okay so what we're going to do is we're going to define our function here our function prototype and that's going to be present horizontal vector and it's going to receive a vector that's going to be passed inside and it's going to be an integer and it's more specifically going to be a reference to the original vector so we don't have to recreate that so there you go there is the prototype so let's get this and let's print this down here and let's go and steal this so that we can have it down here by our function so we can actually see what we are trying to make it's just a matter of breaking everything down into steps all right so I'll throw this here throw our curly brackets inside of here all right so what is the very first thing we're going to need to do well we are going to need to draw in these dashes so how many dashes do we have here one two three four five six seven eight nine 18 total dashes. All right, so what does that tell us? Well, we have three items inside of our vector, and that is 18. So that is telling me that the number of dashes, maybe, is going to be based off of what the size of the vector times six, because that sort of makes sense. So I'm gonna go and get dashes is going to be equal to, and I can go the vec maybe if it was something different you might have to do something like a ceiling with the vector um it's up to you uh, you know if, if it didn't come out from just a raw integer you know non-floating type number but I'm, I'm gonna do it this way just in case we decide that we want to change it all right so there you go there's your dashes what are we gonna have to do then well we're gonna have to print the dashes out on the screen so I'm just gonna go create a simple for loop inside of here and go and print those on our screen so while um, n is less than the total number of dashes that we have, I am going to continue to print out this information. So I'll just go standard C out and then, you know, this is just gonna be dashes, that's it. All right, so after it prints all of the dashes, then what I'm gonna need to do is do a new line. So I'll do a new line inside of here and there we go. All right, so I got all those done. Now what do I need to do? Well, I want to place these values inside of here, but you may have noticed that there's a space right here and then a zero, and then you can see a 10. So I need to line those up properly so that they look nice inside of here. Well, if I want formatting, what do I have to do? Print F. So I'm gonna go uh, and get all the different values inside of our vector. I'm just gonna leave this be n, and while well, n is less than the vector, and if you don't get this, don't you know worry about it. As I've said, the goal here is just to get your brain to work in different ways, challenge your brain, and then to also 
understand how I got my results. So what did I do? Well, I'm going to need a, uh, um, one of these dashes like that. And then after this, what am I going to need to do? I'm going to put like one space inside of there. And then I'm going to put some space inside of here to accommodate two spaces, whether they are there or not. And then I'm going to put another space. And then I am going to go and put N inside of there. All right, so that's going to print that out. And then I can just go and print a new line. Plus, I might have to do a closing brace. So we'll go through here and do all those and that. And then a new line. Okay, so that's all I'm going to need to do to make all of those work. Then what do I need to do? Well, I need to do these dashes again. Well, we can just come in here and just copy this because they're exactly the same dashes as we have on the bottom. So let's go and throw those inside of there. And then for the very next line, I'm going to need to go and get all of the vector values, or actually those are the indexes, and I need to get the vector values in this situation. So I can go and copy this and pretty much do exactly the same thing once again. So let's go like this. And the only difference is I'm going to go the vector and throw n inside of there. And then guess what? Then I have the dashes again and then I'm done. Okay, so good stuff. Not that complicated of a problem. And I think I have all those set up properly and I have this set up properly. Now let's go and get this and you can pause the video if any time I'm going a little bit too fast, we can run it. And we can come over here and you can see there's a little bit of distortion because the vector is so huge. Maybe we want to go and actually shrink that down. Let's go run it again. And hmm, see that went a little bit too far. I wonder why that is. Let's come down here and let's try playing around with this a little bit. Let's go and get rid of this because I don't really think I need it. And get rid of that. Let's try changing this to five instead. All right, got everything saved. And you can see that now it lines up perfectly. All right, so pretty good stuff. And there is an example of how we can automatically generate a horizontal vector on the screen and make it look nice and neat. Just a silly little problem, but good problem nonetheless. And now what I want to do is show you how to generate a Fibonacci numbers. Actually, I think you should do it. So what I'm going to do is have this be a, a problem once again. And how Fibonacci numbers work is basically they're going to use recursion to generate results like such. So if you have a function called fib and you receive a value of zero into it, it's going to return a value of zero. Then you're going to have this is going to continue on and on and on. If you have a value of one in that situation, it's going to return a value of one. And then the very next value that is going to go inside of here is going to be an addition of this plus this. So we're going to come in and we're going to copy this and we can continue going on here. Paste those inside of there. So two is going to be whatever the two previous numbers were added together. So of course that's going to be one and three is going to be equal to the two previous numbers there which is going to be two and so forth and so on. So your goal is to create a function that you're going to receive one of these values and it's going to spit out the proper value. And of course, you're going to use recursion to do so. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you what the main function code is going to look like, and then I'll leave you to figure it out. So we're going to have int, which is going to be index. And then what we're going to do is go standard and print this out. So the user is going to get this message, Fibonacci index, and they're going to enter the index. And then you're going to, of course, receive that index value and store it inside of index. And then you're going to use printf to output fib like this. I guess it would be uppercase fib and then whatever the value is that the user said they wanted and then it's going to be equal to and then you're going to output whatever the result was and of course it's going to be index and then fib and whatever the index is and there that is and that's it okay so now is your job to pause the video and go and create fib all right so what it's going to do let's go and get our prototype here it's going to receive int index and then we're going to create this very few lines of code needed to come in here and get this to execute. Basically, you're going to come in and have your exit scenario. So if index is less than two, well, in that situation, you're just going to return whatever the index value is. Say we're not calling the fib function. 
else we are going to return whatever fib is and index minus one plus and call fib again and index minus two and that is how you're going to calculate all those so we can go in here and we can run it I'll say get Fibonacci index and I'll say three and you can see the two comes back just as we expected and we can run it again and we can say 18 doesn't matter and you can see that we get 2584 okay so there you go hopefully you got that right and if not don't worry about it and now I'm going to talk about how we can overload functions okay so in C++ an overloaded function is just going to have they're gonna be a bunch of functions that have the same function name and the same return type but they have to have different parameters and I don't mean by name I mean the parameter value is actually or the data types gonna to have to be different so let's say we wanted to create an area function that is gonna work for both circles as well as rectangles how would we do that and I'm also gonna cover the switch statement which somehow slipped through and I never covered the switch statement so I'll cover that also all right so by the end of this tutorial series I will have covered everything pretty much imaginable about C++ so if you actually want to learn C++ you are in the right place I'm going to teach you not only the syntax of C++ but I'm going to teach you actually how to program which I think is kind of useful. All right, so there you can see we have double. These things have to be different. So we have a different number of uh, parameters or attributes assigned to them, okay? If I instead just had height like this, that would not work because you have to have two different data types, okay? So there we are. So now what we need to do is go and define how these operate. So let's just come in here and do radius. And how do we do radius? Well, we're just gonna go return and we'll do one four one five nine times standard and you remember how to get the power of a value it's going to be pow just make sure you have c math here whenever you do that and you're going to go radius and you're going to pass in two okay so there we go we created that and now we're going to have to do the same thing for our rectangular calculations and for homework maybe you go in here and try to figure out how to create area for finding areas of trapezoids how about that sounds like fun work okay so we're gonna go return in this situation and it's just gonna be height times width all right so there we go we defined our two functions and here's a switch statement well first off I'm gonna go see out and I'm gonna ask the user to area for our circle and whoops so they're going to enter C for circle, or if they want to get the area of a rectangle, they're going to enter R. All right, not exactly the best, uh, the clearest interface here, but it's good enough for our purposes right now. And we're going to store that, so that's going to be area type. And then I'm going to go, of course, get whatever they input inside of here. So that's gonna be stored in area type. And then here's a switch statement. Now a switch statement's gonna be used anytime you want to perform different actions on a limited number of conditions. So the conditions are gonna be, they enter a C, we do one thing. They enter an R, we do one thing. If they enter neither, we print out an error message, okay? So we'll have case they enter, to make sure you use single quotes here, if they entered a C, and then you're gonna put a colon inside of here, then you're gonna perform certain actions. So you're gonna go and you're gonna do, or ask the user to enter the radius. We could have put this in our function down below, but I wanted to use the switch statement because I haven't done that. And then we're gonna go and store our radius and so we'll get on this and store it in our radius variable and then we can go and call for that to execute so we'll go area is equal to and then call our area function that we created down here and pass in the value for radius inside of it and there we go all right and then what you're going to need to do is go break what that's going to do is it's going to break out of the whole switch statement and stop checking other things but we have another condition. We have the condition if they typed in an R. 
Well, in that situation, we're going to change this to R. Let's move this up here a little bit so you can see it better. So we're going to say if they entered R, well, we're going to say enter height and store that in something called height. And we're also going to have width. So let's go and create that as well. And then we're going to store this in the height function. And then we're going to go get this guy as well and paste that here. And then we'll go and store this as well. Paste that there. And this is going to be width. And then this is going to be width and there we go an area is going to be equal we can keep this called area and we can go height and width and that's going to automatically work for us and then if they don't enter in a c or an r well in that situation we have to give them an error message and we're going to call default is going to be what is called if neither of the other conditions above are true so we'll go default and in the situation in which they don't enter what we want them to enter we're going to say, please enter C or R. And this could be put into a loop structure so it continues asking them, but this is good enough. So let's run it and see if it works. And you can see over here that it says area, circle, or rectangle. Let's say we do a circle and then we can do something like 2.5. And you can see it did that calculation for us. And we could do formatting if we wanted to have less or more decimal places and rectangle. And we could have 10 and 10. And there you can see that worked. And then we can run it again. And then we can type in G. And it's gonna say, please enter C or R. Okay. So there you go, guys. There is more information about C++. Hope you enjoyed that. And like always, please leave your questions and comments below. Otherwise, till next time.